Frost Yarn, and this is the everything you need to know about how to kettle dye yarn. If you don't know what kettle dyeing is, think Malabrigo or Manos del Uruguay, or pretty much any indie dyed yarn you see on the market where it's basically water coloring on yarn. So the first technique is gonna to be tonal, so all one color family, high water table and low water table. What we're gonna do is put about a tablespoon or so of citric acid in each of our pans. Now we're gonna fill it up in the sink. Just enough to melt the citric acid together. And we're gonna put our skeins in. Now, this is gonna be our high water table, so oops. What I like to do is basically place them in there in a circle like this. That way you get even color saturation. And we're gonna do one superwash skein, one non-superwash skein to show the difference in dye uptake. There we go. And you want to soak your fiber for, pro I mean, minimum half an hour, but if you can do a couple hours, that will allow for maximum absorption. Now we're gonna to top it off. And do the same on the other side. So I'm gonna explain what the difference is between high water table and low water table. It just has to do with how much water you have in the pan. So in our high water table yarn, we're gonna have much more diffusion and dispersion of colors. We're going to, you're talking about like, larger white patches that aren't going to get dyed that are underneath the color. You're not going to have vivid spots and then less vivid spots. In the low water table yarn, that's where you're going to have the most saturation. So I'm going to show you right here our high water table yarn. As you can see, it's got about a quarter inch of water above the yarn. Right here on our low water table, you can see that the yarn's actually sticking out. Now we're going to end up adding plus minus a quarter to a third of a cup of liquid dye stock. Some people like to put powder directly in. It's a technique I use myself, but when we're talking about a traditional tonal yarn with variegation all in the same color family, if you put dye powder directly in, you will not have the watercolor effect. You'll have really, really saturated sections where the dye is, and then directly underneath where that dye powder landed, it will be bone white, unless you work it in really quickly. So we're going to be using liquid dye stock, so I'm accounting for that. So basically, with the high water table, it's going to be about an inch of water above the yarn. And in our low water table, when we've added the dye, it's going to be just about level. Just enough water for the dye to float off the bottom, or for the fiber to float off the bottom. You don't want to scorch your yarn. If you have too little water, you will burn it, especially if it's super washed with nylon content. That nylon does scorch and crystallize if it's too high of a heat. And since we're gonna be on uh, fire burners and not induction, that's something you really have to work out for. So next, next we're gonna go into how to apply the dye. We have our low water table and our high water table side by side, and we're gonna be doing the same pie wedge shape with all blues. This is Bright Aqua from Dharma, Turquoise from Prochem, Extreme Blue from Dharma. This is a very concentrated dye stock. So if you want it to be less concentrated, just draw up a little bit of citric acid water to shear it out. So now we're going to be making dye stock. So I have my dyes lined up behind the jars. We'll be using a 60 ml syringe and a proper respirator. I got this at Home Depot and our giant jar of citric acid. The recipe for dye stock will be in the comments. I'm sorry, in the um, description as well as all the other info. Now we add in our dye. This is a mix of Prochem and Dharma Wash Fast Acid. 
Now we get our tap as hot as it'll go and I'll put a little bit in and mix, mix, mix until it's well saturated and dissolved. And this is near boiling hot. My sink goes to near. I'm gonna grab a little bit of aqua and we're gonna draw a third like so. And in goes the dye, and I like to work it in as I syringe so we don't have white patches. So as you can see, if I peel this apart, underneath we have sections with no dye. So we're going to use the syringe to work dye in. Let me go like this. So I like to use tongs and flip it back and go through and look for any non-saturated sections, but it looks like we've mostly got it taken care of. And we do the next section, which is gonna be our turquoise, and we go across the top, pushing it down. And now we're going to work back here and put just a tiny bit in. And since this isn't warm yet, I can actually kind of work that in with my finger. Now we're going to get some extreme blue and notice that this has become slightly viscous. Extreme blue needs to be used right away. This isn't a dye stock that lasts a day or two. And now we're just going to fill in the rest. See now if you don't go through, we're just going to pull this up. Do you see how there's large sections where it's, it looks like it's blue, but this will be almost white by the time it dries. So you add a little bit more dye stock in, work it down. You want some variation, but you don't want giant white patches like right here. Now we're gonna turn the heat on. I personally like it to come up to just under a simmer. I don't want any movement. But if you look, we've got really good saturation, lighter tones, mid-tones, deep tones, and some great crossover between these colors. Now we're going to do the same thing, but with our high water table. So there's going to be less saturation, more diffusion of colors, and more light patches. So here we go. And color number two. So you can see there's a lot more spread and a lot less saturation once we work it in. And our third color right here. The extreme blue looks kind of muddy now, but it's a heat activated color. So I'm gonna show you, this is just one minute on the heat. Here's our extreme blue from Dharma heat. Here's our extreme blue from Dharma, no heat. Not all colors are heat activated. We hit 15 minutes on the heat, and as you can see, it's totally clear. Now over here, yeah, we're pretty much done here too. So we're gonna let these cool to room temperature. So here we have our high water table and our low water table. This one right here is our superwash and our non-superwash. So you can see slight differences in dye uptake on the superwash versus non-superwash and much richer color value on the low water table versus the high water table. Do our rainbow bullseye dye application. Let's move this over here. Just like it sounds, we start in the center. Okay. Now we're going to move. And this is what I love and about using a syringe. But see how I go slightly outside and then I work the color towards the next one? If I actually overlap the margins, this pink will get completely overtaken by the orange. So you want to leave a little bit of a margin. And then here we go. This is going to produce the most um, random and highly, highly variegated of all the dye styles when you go back to knit it. And then here we go. And 
and you definitely want to do your bullseye if you're using multiple colors. Low water table, as you can see, cross-contamination if you had a high water table would be very likely and you'd get a lot of mudding and brown out. And then we just go around the outside and work that in. Now I'm actually going to put this on the heat and let the colors absorb for a couple minutes. And then once they've absorbed, I'm going to go back in and start directly depositing color where there is less saturation. If I go and do it now, this whole thing is going to get browned out. Now with our pie wedge, it's just like it sounds. Since we're going to be doing seven colors, we're going to make them pretty thin. And then just work the die up this way. You can also just do it in thirds, pink, yellow, and blue. And then you'll have some margin colors, but I, I like to be special, so I'm going to do extra. And then we do it here. Then I'm going to work it. Remember, we don't want to saturate the margins because then you'll not have two distinct colors. And here's our yellow. And here's our green. And then we work it towards it. And aqua. Same thing. I want to let some of the colors absorb before I go in and hunt down those white patches. And here's our turquoise. I like to use bright aqua from Dharma and turquoise from Prochem in tandem because I think they make a really nice complement to each other. And here we go with our true violet. Again, this is a Prochem color and it is incredibly saturated and beautiful. So this time I'm starting in the middle of the wedge and moving the dye outwards because this purple will spread like wildfire. See, we've managed to have no brownouts. Same with over here. So here we are on our bullseye and I'm going to start peeling the layers back, injecting a little bit of violet where there are unsaturated sections of the blue. If I was doing this while we still had active dye from the first application, we would be creating a muddy, muddy mess. See, yellow tends to disappear, so that's the one I'll go in with last. So now the color's mostly absorbed on our pie wedge, and what I like to do is take the previous color, so the hot pink, instead of reinforcing over hot pink, I go into the previous color, the purple, and this gives me some really nice variation. I add the hot pink in here. Remember, we don't want it to bleed over into that blue too much. And over here in the blue section, we're gonna peel it back, and I'm gonna put a little bit of yellow, because that's gonna green it up really nicely. And maybe a little section in here. This is that wonderful, typical kettle dyed effect that we all love. And then we're going to take some of this turquoise and work it in back here just a little bit. Makes the most beautiful teal green color. But we want this nice bright patch right here to stay as it is. And I feel like this yellow section is overrepresented, so we're going to put in just a little bit of Spearmint Breeze, which when mixed with the fluorescent lemon, makes a really pretty grassy green color. There we go. And there it is. We have our bullseye. As you can see, a significant amount of overmixing here. It's much harder to keep the colors tight. We have our superwash here and our non-superwash here. Subtle, slight variation in color. There's a, quite a bit more pink in here because it absorbed immediately, whereas this had time to overmix because it takes longer on the non-superwash for the dye to bind to the fiber. Other than that, they're pretty similar. Here we have our cross compare of non superwash versus superwash. This one is markedly brighter, but another interesting thing is 
If you look at some like staining sections where some of the violet migrated over the yellow, if we look really closely, right, we've got some grayish mottled tones. Same section, same skein, significantly less um, diluted looking, right? So I think it's because the dye acts quicker on the superwash and it takes longer to absorb on the non-superwash and therefore you get a little bit of overmixing. So in this one we're going to do the full length of the skein in the pan. Now I don't know of any Schaefer trays that are actually this long. So what I like to do is I take all four and I have them like this, right? So that when I'm dying, it goes across all four. If these aren't lined up like that, but if they're kind of twisted, you'll have white patches inside of the skeins and they won't match. And we've all bought 10 of some beautifully watercolor painted yarn that one of them looked really good and the other nine didn't match at all and the finished knit didn't look like matching skeins. So this is how I get them all to match as much as possible. Now, as you can see, the skein is quite long so we're gonna do a slight S shape like this, but we don't wanna overlap them. We're just giving them a gentle amount of curve. and making sure that they're all equally represented, they're not overlapping on each other, so that when we place the die, we have the best effect. So the next two techniques we're gonna talk about is a U-shaped placement in the pan, which would give you matching tips and ends. The skeins look amazing in photos, but it gives you a really short repeat when you're knitting it. So. Great for socks, not necessarily so much for a sweater because you're going to get a lot of pooling and you might not like the effect. And the second one is going to be utilizing the full length of the pan and just how we lay it in so that we get even amounts of color. So first with the U-shaped ends and tips, we take our two skeins, one superwash, one non, right? And you want to make sure they're really, they're not like bedraggled or anything and we're gonna fold them in half, like a U, and place it in the pan. Now ideally you would be using one of the shorter Schaefer trays, but we don't, I don't use those, but we're gonna use what we have. I think this water table is honestly a bit high, so I'm gonna siphon off some of this, but this is the basic shape, right? You want a nice U, you don't want fiber bulked on top, and you don't want it like this because you want to get really even fiber. So when you twist it into a skein, you'll get that beautiful, classic matching ends and tips look. Pause. Now I'm ready to set up for the next technique, which is going to be your standard full sheet of rainbow paint. And this is the matching ends and tips. So with this one, you're going to have a much shorter repeat since the skeins are in half. This would be ideal for socks or um, small cast-ons. This is sock weight, so maybe like a 50 or a 60 cast-on. Otherwise, you'll get really heavy variegation in pooling. And this would be ideal for your sweaters and your larger cast-on shawl projects. Since we're doing all rainbow to really show the cross-compare between the different techniques, we'll just block our color in like this. reason I'm moving it around is so that it gets evenly saturated. No white spots. And in with our orange, and again, leave yourself about a quarter inch of space so you can actually work this color up towards the pink so it doesn't overtake it. If I put this on the line, as you can see when I work it in, see how much that migrated into the pink and changed the color, as opposed to having a nice even fade. Now we've got this on the heat, and once the color is mostly absorbed, so I'm gonna give it about five or 10 minutes, 
Then I'm going to go back in and I'm going to start peeling apart and looking for these little patches and adding in more color. If I do that now, we'll end up with excess dye in the water table and the heat's going to pull it in a circular motion clockwise or counterclockwise. So you'll get this pink mudding up the green and the orange coming into the blue and you'll end up with sides, the, the skeins on the sides, discolored. Because this is so short compared to this, we're going to want to keep our color placement really tight and really thin. Or you could just do, you know, your red, yellow, blue, and you'll get the colors, but they'll be shorter where they touch. So it'll be like blue is overrepresented, then a little bit of green, yellow is overrepresented, then a little bit of orange, and then pink tips in the finished knit. And see, I'm trying to keep it on the skein and not getting onto the sides here because that's going to migrate. So if you're really worried about dye migration, you can get a clean syringe and just suck it up. And that's how I keep, like let's say we were doing a violet, pink, orange, gold. You don't want this excess violet to work its way up to the gold and turn it brown. Now we're back over here, and now the dye is mostly absorbed, so we can start looking for these lighter patches and directly syringing in color. You can also add colors opposite the spectrum, just a little bit to tone it, which I'll show in the next technique. I did get a tiny bit of browning on the edge tips on the left-hand side, but that's because the pan is too big and I only had two skeins available for this. If you had a shorter pan or an extra set of skeins, there wouldn't be so much water migration, FYI. We have our full pan rainbow. This is our superwash. This is our non-superwash. And I think the only real difference you can see on the superwash is that there's quite a bit more patchy application, meaning that the dye struck immediately instead of migrating and giving more of a watercolored effect like this. But it's really minor. And honestly, this non-superwash is performing so beautifully. And I think it's because it's super fine 17 micron merino instead of the standard 22 micron that you get that would have a much larger difference. So here is our U shape, right? The matching ends and the matching tips. We packed a lot of color in here. If we had just done a one color gradient from lightest to darkest, it would have probably been more apparent. Anyhow, this would be great for socks, but not necessarily for a sweater. It would cause way too high a variegation unless you like the clown barf look. So here would be our non-superwash and our superwash. Another way to do matching ends and tips is to dye in a palindrome. So right here, this is going to be the bottom where the skein um, starts the twist and then you would book match it. So in our case, we're going to do a blue violet, then a hot pink on either side of that, then a hot peach on either side of that, and tip it with orange on the ends. So I have my citric acid water for changing the consistency or the, vibra uh, the vibrancy of the dye. Here's our blue violet, which is Dharma's Midnight and Prochem's Brilliant Violet, Prochem's Hot Pink, Dharma's Fluorescent Safety Orange. It's super important that these are laid in as equally as possible and that you go right on the middle. If you need to measure it and mark it with tape on the sides, then do that. So let's just grab this up because we're going to have orange at the ends. We don't want any accidental browns. We're going to get rid of this excess dye. We're going to grab some citric acid water because I want to shear out our next section of hot pink. And get some hot pink. Here we go in with our lighter. And we're going to grab some more citric acid water. A tiny bit of the hot pink. And a tiny bit of the orange. And this will make a really pretty neon peach color. And then we go with that. 
And for our last color, we're going to do some bright orange. So here our color is laid in and I'm going to grab with a clean dry gloved hand just a pinch of this fluorescent lemon. And just over this section, this is not to speckle it because this is too cakey and powdery to speckle, but I want to give a little bit of marbling in this area. Obviously don't go over the blue purple section or you'll get brown out. There we go. Here is our matching ends and tips done in a palindrome. And I wanted to bring this in for comparison. So this was all the colors, right, of the rainbow. I think these palindromes, especially when they're done in a single pan, look better when you do three colors, right? So the midnight, the pink, and the orange. Because once you try to add in every color, you sort of lose that effect. And while I do think these make pretty skeins, I'm not so sure that I am in love with the effect. I mean, no question, photographed, you know, this is always going to sell. This probably will. I think this is a little bit, you can see there's a similarity that there's a pool in the middle and a pool in the middle with the striping that comes in on either side. But this is more limited. And, you know, if you make a beautiful skein and you sell it and someone has to keep ripping it out because they don't like how it hatches on the sides like this, they're not going to send it back to you, but they'll never buy from you again. And obviously this is way too busy. You'd have to be, you know, this could be a sock or a small sleeve on a baby sweater, but this is just, like I said, not to, not something that I would necessarily love. Final technique, we are going to be dyeing a standard rainbow, and we're actually going to be flipping the skeins carefully, and we're going to dye the back side with complementary colors, meaning orange on the pink section, yellow on the orange section, etc., to create more of a marbled effect. Same thing on this side, except instead of using complementary colors, we're going to use the opposite. So yellow against violet, orange against blue, etc. We've got our two identical batches, and we've got them on the heat, and once the dye has absorbed, we're going to let it cool, and then we're going to flip these skeins so the back side is what's visible, and then we're going to do our second portion of the technique. Now that these are cool to the touch and the dye is absorbed, we're going to grab them from back here, and we're going to do a nice clean flip so that we can do the back side. So here we go, and we want to keep it in the same water. And I just lift it, switch it to the back. There we go. Wish I could give you an overhand view, but I'm by myself most of these days. My husband's at work. But flipping a skein over is not rocket science. You can figure that shit out. You can see, even though we took precautions and went in looking for white patches we've still got quite a bit of desaturation which is why I like to flip my skeins because now we can put third colors in here that's really going to add a lot of visual interest to the finished piece instead of just your standard rainbow. So next up we're going to dust on complementary colors, opposite colors. I'll introduce you to this tool that we're going to be using it's called a cake dusting wand, and it has a nifty little contraption here. When you turn it, it opens it, then you load in your die, then you close it, and you can tap, tap, tap. I will be doing a video at some point showing all the different ways you can use this for actual speckling, but today we're just going to be using it to add complementary and um, opposite colors off the spectrum to the backs of our yarn. I'm going to grab up a little bit of this pink dye. And we're going to gently tap some over the green section. Make sure to wipe this off in between with a clean paper towel that's dry. I have one on here. And we're going to get some of the yellow. Just a little bit. And then here we go. 
just a little there. Tiny bit of turquoise. This is a really, really, really powerful color, so we don't want a lot. And we're gonna do a quick dusting over this orange. We don't wanna drown out the color or create brown, right? We just wanna do a little bit of shade shifting. And a tiny bit here of Spearmint Breeze, which is a light green color. And we're gonna bring that over the pink. I do not speckle low immersion. A lot of people do. I prefer to do it as a second pass. If you wanna see that video, I will link it below. Now we're gonna reheat set this. Now on this side, we're gonna do complementing colors. So one next to it on the color wheel. So I'll probably do a little bit of violet here, and I'm probably gonna do some gold in through the orange, some yellow on the green, right? Some purple on the turquoise, etc. Do just a little bit of violet across our pink. This color really, really spreads. So you wanna bring some of this yellow here. And we're also going to bring it over the green. Check out this dye mistake. So I didn't clean this because I'm filming and obviously pregnant. So in between the violet and moving to the yellow. And so look, tiny bits of violet intermixed with the yellow turned this section a rust color. Isn't that funny? So that's not what we were going for, but... I like to show the mistakes as well as the failures and the successes. Now we've got some turquoise and we're just going to come over here like a so. Go with our hot pink back here. You want to work quick with this particular hot pink from ProChem because if you look, it is super finely milled. So it's going to fall through these tiny little holes a lot faster than say this one from Dharma, which is um, a lemon color, or this one, if you look at the consistency, it's quite thick. And this one will drop cleaner. So here we have our complementary speckling, which means using opposite colors. So we have some green. This is the non, or I'm sorry, this is the superwash side. And you can see that the green still showed up clearly over the orange base. But on the non-superwash, it actually didn't get quite as clean. You have more blotching and staining, and it looks a bit more brown. Other than that, you can see that because it took longer for the dye to penetrate, we have a lot less white patches here than we do here. However, we have deeper colors on the superwash than on the non-superwash. Here we have our analogous speckling on our full pan of kettle dyed, meaning, you know, the purple speckles on the pink, the orange speckles on the yellow, the yellow on the green, etc., as opposed to opposite like our previous one. And there's some subtle but significant differences between our non-superwash and our superwash over here. I want you to look at the quality of these speckles. See how they're not quite speckles? They're really more like blotches. And you've got that over here too, right? As opposed to, you see the difference? How tight and crisp a lot of these speckles are here on the superwash. Look how tiny. We don't have any of this tiny, tiny definition over on our non-superwash skein. It's similar, but you have more of a muddy speckle and a blotchy speckle here as opposed to a tighter, crisper, like... You can see definition in these purple speckles, but here, not so much. Overall though, very pretty.